Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'll be going over the complete design to part process of the weapon disc on RE Combat Robotics' newest 15 pound battle bot. There's a lot of different tools, processes, and materials involved in this, so let's get right into it. For those not familiar with BattleBots weapons, specifically vertical spinners, let's first go over a couple of key design considerations and concepts using my current 15 pounder, Razor's Edge, as an example. Vertical spinners dish out damage by spinning a large mass with some sort of contact tooth vertically. They are some of the most efficient designs for a BattleBot because half of the energy stored from the hit is transferred into the opponent, while the other half is transferred into the arena floor. In theory, not sending your own robot flying. The general equation for the energy stored by the spinning mass is Ke equals 1 half Iw squared, where I is the moment of inertia of the spinning weapon, and W is the angular velocity. As can be seen in the equation, doubling the spinning speed of the new weapon would quadruple the energy stored. Both Razor's Edge and this new robot we're building are designed to spin around 16,000 RPM, which is close to the maximum speed achievable due to air resistance, bearing speed limitations, and other factors. So without increasing the speed, how else could this equation be optimized? Since the only other variable is mode of inertia, this is what needs to change. An overly simplified equation for moment of inertia is I equals MR squared, where M is mass and R is radius. Once again, if the radius of the weapon were doubled, the energy storage would be quadrupled. Especially since mass is so valuable in a 15 pound weight class, this new large diameter weapon design stores much more energy than that of the current drum on Razor's Edge allowing it to hit much harder. In order to effectively deliver that energy into the opponent's robot, the weapon needs to get a good bite. This new disc goes about that in two ways. By making the disc relatively thin, at only 5 eighths of an inch thick, all that energy is applied over a very small area, allowing the disc to cut through armor and get a solid bite on the opponent's robot. The other factor that helps to increase bite is the very long asymmetric tooth. If the disc were symmetrical and there are two teeth on the weapon, then the opponent's robot would only have half the time to move into the path of the tooth. By designing the disc with one tooth and internally balancing it, this gives the best chance for a full contact hit every time the tooth comes around. With these factors in mind, I designed the weapon assembly you see here. The spin diameter is 7.5 inches, with an inch and a quarter stick out on the tooth. The assembly is belt driven by a half inch XL timing belt and rides on a 17mm shaft. There are three main machine parts in this design, the disc itself, the hub, and the pulley. Starting off with the disc, this part was made out of AR450 armor plate steel. Many other robots in the 15 pound weight class run S7 weapons hardened up to 60 Rockwell, but these can sometimes shatter. On Razor's Edge, I used H13 tool steel hardened to 45 Rockwell. This guaranteed my weapon would never break, but was extremely expensive. AR450 is a pre-hardened wear plate coming in at just under 45 Rockwell. It is extremely durable and vastly cheaper than H13 or S7 hence why I'm using it here. The one drawback to using AR450 is how difficult to machine it is. To cut the blanks of the disc out of the 5 8 inch plate I purchased, I used the water jet located at the 1819 Innovation Hub at University of Cincinnati. The 3-axis water jet at UC doesn't have any sort of way to compensate for the edge of the part being tapered, but as I was simply cutting out the blanks with 50,000 stock left on all edges, they could be done very quick. The next process was to finish all edges on the CNC bridge port. This took two operations using a 6 flute bull nose cutter to do this. The aluminum backer plate underneath the part was so I didn't cut into the machine bed, and each part was trammed in with an indicator before running the program. For the full depth side cutting, I used 30 inches per minute feed rate, 3000 RPM, and 2000 step over. I was very impressed with the finish I was able to achieve with this, and dimensional accuracy was spot on. For machining the 3 16 counterbore in the center of the part, I kept the same feed rate and RPM, but increased my step over to 15 thou. Lastly, I machined a 50 thou chamfer with the bull nose of the cutter so that the sharp corner wouldn't interfere with the weapon hub. The disc needed 8 1032 holes drilled and tapped into it. To do this, I had to use a solid carbide drill bit and custom order a solid carbide tap after my cobalt steel one just wouldn't cut it. This was a horrible experience I wouldn't wish on anyone. Please don't try to tap AR steels. Just design your part with a nut and bolt instead. The next part to make was the hub for the inside of the part. The design of this piece is kind of complicated. The drilled flange you see lines up with the counterboard holes in the disc, allowing the hub to be bolted to it. 
The octagon on the part is the drive piece. This feature lines up with the disc and is what transfers rotational energy from the motor to the disc. Without this octagon, the bolts will be under shear during spin-ups and hits, causing premature failure. The large thread on the part is an inch and a half, 18 pitch, left-handed thread. I'll go into more detail on this when I talk about the pulley, but this is what helps secure the bearings. Speaking of bearings, the center bore on the hub is what holds four 6903 2RS bearings. These were chosen for their high speed rating, and four of them were needed in order to survive the impacts this weapon will be dishing out. The hub itself is made from 4140, hardened to 35 Rockwell. I chose this as a good blend of impact strength, tensile strength, and hardness in order to resist wear. To make it, this part required a lot of machining. I started out with a 2.5 inch piece of annealed 4140 round stock, which I needed to purchase a horizontal bandsaw in order to cut. After cutting the stock on the bandsaw and chucking the slug into the mill, one side of the part was roughed out with a 3 quarter inch end mill with 15 thou stock to leave on all sides. Stock was left in case the part moved during heat treat and will be hard milled later. I won't go over the feeds and speeds on this one because the cutters I was using turned out to be really dull regrinds, which explains why I had to run them so slow. The other side of the part wasn't as eventually critical, so it was machined to size using the same hard mill cutter I used in previous operations. This wasn't the best suited cutter for the material I was cutting, but I was under a time crunch to get these parts out to heat treat. And now they're back. These were quenched and tempered at Winston heat treat and bead blasted as well, hence the surface finish. In order to hard mill this part, I whipped up a quick set of soft jaws and started cutting. The feeds and speeds up for this part were nearly identical to that used on the AR450. I machined all surfaces down to within two thou of their finished dimensions, measured them, and then crept up on the final size, test fitting the bearings and disc as I went. In the end, the bearings required a very light press fit with the arbor press, and the disc fits on nice and snug. The last process for the weapon hub is machining the threads. For this, I purchased a couple of new tools, a half inch solid carbide single point thread mill, a one to two inch micrometer, and a thread wire set. With these, I was able to thread mill the inch and a half 18 left-handed thread, measure the size using the micrometer and thread wires, and adjust as needed. Both of the hubs I machined turned out pretty dead on dimensionally, and I was very impressed with the thread mill's performance in hardened steels. With the hub now done, it was time to move on to the last part, the pulley. This part is a custom 30 tooth XL timing belt pulley with a large counterbore, threads, through hole, and some spanner wrench holes machined into it. Luckily, I was able to purchase a piece of 30 tooth XL pulley stock online, so all I had to do was cut off a piece on the bandsaw and machine the features. The piece of stock was then chucked up in the bandsaw, cut off, and then moved to the soft jaws on the mill. For material removal on this, I'm using a 3 8 inch 3 flute end mill from Haas Tooling. This thing chews through aluminum and leaves a great surface finish while doing so. Machining some 6061 T6 aluminum was also a nice break from the hardened skills the rest of the assembly was made out of. After all the material was removed, the internal threads needed to be cut. The single point thread mill I purchased earlier can also be used for internal threading, so that's handy. But because the internal threads can't be measured with thread wires, I had to use one of the hubs I made as a gauge. I made three of these pulleys with the threads in the first one ending up a little bit looser than I would have liked. So I adjusted it and the second two turned out great. The last part of the pulley was to drill six eighth inch holes in it so I could tighten it down with a spanner wrench. And because the spanner wrench is a custom size and design, I had to make it myself. This was a pretty quick but still cool process to watch. I took a scrap slug of steel from another project, drilled the same hole pattern as the pulley into it, then brought it over to the welder. Here, I TIG welded some 8th inch dowel pins into the main piece, ground it flat, then welded a half inch nut to the top so I could crank on it with a torque wrench. The pins were also cut to length, ground, and deburred to fit nicely into the pulley. Now with all the pieces in place, it's time to assemble the weapon. The four bearings are first installed into the weapon hub with the arbor press, making sure they are seated all the way into the bore. After that, the hub is bolted to the disc. Eight low profile alloy steel 1032 socket head screws are used for this, with a bit of 242 Loctite applied to each one so they won't vibrate out during competition. A witness mark is also applied once they're torqued to spec. Lastly, the pulley gets screwed onto the hub. 
once again with a bit of blue Loctite to prevent it from vibrating loose, and a witness mark applied after torquing it down with the custom spanner wrench. Overall, I'm very happy with how this weapon assembly turned out. Spinning it by hand at least, the weapon feels very smooth and balanced at low RPMs. I haven't yet gotten the time to make the 17mm shaft this rides on to test it at higher RPMs, but I'm really looking forward to seeing how it does. This new weapon assembly was started a lot sooner than I was planning on building the rest of the robot that goes along with it. This was because this video was done in part as a class project for my manufacturing class at UC. I do hope to build the rest of the robot that goes along with this new weapon, but it may be a while before that's completed. I hope you all enjoyed the look into the manufacturing process for this new weapon assembly. There are a bunch more photos I took of these parts while manufacturing them that didn't quite make it into the video, but they'll be up on the RE Combat Robotics Instagram page, which will be linked down below in the video description. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about the CNC conversion on the bridge port, click over here. And if you'd like to see more of Razor's Edge in battle, click here. Until next time, stay safe, and thanks for watching.